Well, it's wonderful to be here with so many committed climate scientists and communicators and people who uh, want to make a difference in the world. We've heard a lot about communication and about both verbal communication and visual communication. We've heard a lot about how people care how people think that perhaps climate change is just for the future. What I would like to do in this talk is take us back to the past and talk about climate change events and extreme events in the past and how we can use that as a story to talk about the impact of humans on the landscape and also the responses of humans to climate change experiences so that people can relate to that now and, again, think about the future. Um, my name is Cheryl Lazatter Beach, and I'm a professor and associate chair of geography and geoinformation science at George Mason. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, co PIs, uh, Dr. Timothy Beach, who's here with us today. He's the chair of science, technology, and international affairs at Georgetown University. I would also like to acknowledge Nicholas Dunning, Vernon Scarborough at the University of Cincinnati, and Scott Heckbert, who is, um, who is a agent-based model specialist in, in Canada in Alberta Innovates Technology Futures. So let's move forward. Um, we are going to look at an iconic subject of climate and civilization interaction, the case of the Maya in Central America. We'll synthesize this case of climate and collapse towards present-day graphical and spatial modeling efforts. The ultimate goal of our multidisciplinary efforts, beyond understanding and modeling the interactive histories of the ancient Maya and the environment, is to use these lessons and models to understand our modern society from complex systems perspective and shed light on our own vulnerabilities and the climate change future. And I present to you another gratuitous, charismatic megafauna. Although I love polar bears, I also love jaguars. And we thank Tim Beach for this photograph from um, the program for Belize. So, our challenge. We've heard a lot of challenges about getting over um, attitudes about climate, attitudes about environment, attitudes about the relationship between people and the environment. Scholars in both the natural sciences and the social sciences have had to dig wide and deep to rise above misguided and simple casual causal relationships of the early 20th century science to move forward in favor of a more complex, multivariable, and multidirectional relationship found in interdisciplinary work. A further task is to dispel old notions of linear cause and effect relationships and successfully communicate convincing alternative hypotheses that frame issues in their complexity. I'll start with the good news. Um, that's something we've all been trying to do uh, over the past few days. The good news about the Maya is that 8 million Maya live today, and they speak dozens of Mayan languages. But who are the Maya? I want to, first of all, introduce you to um, who are the Maya, and where do they live, and why are we studying them. Second, I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of um, research into the Maya and the environment. And then, in the end, I'm going to give you some examples of what I think are some very successful ways of communicating that relationship between ancient Maya society and the environment, bringing us forward to some conclusions. The Maya are a complex society, and we're a complex society. They had stone architecture and stone tools. They had astronomy. They had mathematics. They had the zero. They can conceive of numbers that were far larger than their own perceived history. They had art, ceramics, agriculture, plant domestication, and they had writing. The ancient Maya were a literate society whose books endured until the Spaniards burned most of them, except for four remaining books uh, in the conquest. We have then Maya inscriptions, copious iconography, and millions of descendants and speakers of Mayan languages which survive today that help us to reconstruct the story of the ancient Maya. But we also need to use uh, the arts of archaeology, the science of archaeology, and the science of environmental reconstruction or paleoenvironmental science to help uh, fill in uh, a, a richer history of the ancient environment and the ancient Maya. So where did the Maya uh, live? Uh, and, and where is the Maya culture focused now is in the Mesoamerican region of Central America from Yucatan, Mexico to Honduras and El Salvador. The ancient Maya civilization that we're focusing on spans a time from pre-Maya societies in 1100 years BCE to the late classic period collapse around 900 CE. 
The politics and the religion of the ancient Maya revolved around a, div a divine kingship which intercedes with, with deities on behalf of the society. I'd like to talk a little bit about convergence of evidence and move forward to uh, what compels some of us to study the ancient Maya and the environment. And David Webster of Penn State um, sums this up very well. He says, our fascination with Maya droughts is probably directly related to our own concerns about global warming and climate change. He also talks about, in the context of the ancient Maya, nowhere did a single cause operate on its own. None of these stresses were new. Similar problems contributed to the earlier crises so evident in our record of Maya culture history. A little bit about the background environment. Uh, the ancient Maya lived in a tropical wet and dry climate. We're talking about 17 to 18 and a half degrees north latitude. It was a seasonal tropical forest, and as this water budget from uh, Belize uh, demonstrates, it, it was not, not rainy all the time. There's not a solid precipitation as you think about the typical tropical region. The Maya contended with a drought period regularly every year between January and then May, the rainy season came again, and then a shorter dry season again sometime around July. So they had to have infrastructure in everyday life to get through those periods of drought. As a hydrologist, I've been working in uh, the Maya world, studying uh, both water quality and water quantity and trying to look at the methods and infrastructure that the Maya have have put in place to get through this regular period of drought. As a Californian, and uh, having grown up in Northern California and worked in water resources, we too have to deal with a form of drought every year. That's just part of the climate of California and here too in the tropical uh, wet and dry climate. People have to contend with uh, a dry season. The ancient Maya engineered both urban and agricultural landscapes to develop and conserve water resources. They built aguadas, reservoirs, chiltoons, diversions and weirs, canals and wells. So there was a lot of infrastructure uh, devoted to water resources. So what are the Maya droughts? Uh, much of what is written on the Maya collapse and on the Maya droughts is history written by non-Maya writers because many of the books were burned. Um, four books on pounded fig bark called codices are all that remain of the Maya history books after the Spanish burned, again, thousands of books and artifacts at contact. Now, we have a record of what, what um, some of what was written uh, because of uh, De Landa, who wrote in his defense to the Spanish crown about Maya daily life. At the time of the conquest, he transcribed Maya syllables and glyphs into Spanish, leaving an important key to the language for future scholars, including Maya inscriptions on stones. So the concept of drought what did the ancient Maya know? Well, in addition to the infrastructure, um, they, the remaining books do refer to drought. Uh, drought appears um, in almanac frames of three out of the four surviving Maya codices. The word appears about 57 times. Drought is represented by an ancient Maya glyph, kaktetun, or firestone tree. Now, these are in the context of negative auguries or divinations. Think of, um, you know, the farmer's almanac. And so these, um, many of these codices served as divinations or almanacs for what was to come. And they don't necessarily record drought events or dates, so it makes it very difficult to use them as um, a historical timeline or a historical source. So when were the Maya droughts? Uh, visualizing climate change. Uh, moving forward to 2003, Hogg et al. published a paper called Climate and the Collapse of Maya Civilization in Science. And using titanium variation in ocean cores off the Carioca Basin, they support the drought roll hypothesis very, uh, very clearly and visually with this graphic of titanium through time. And so we have um, a pre-classic abandonment here, and you see um, a, a dip in titanium. Now, titanium represents runoff, so when there's a lot of precipitation, there's a lot of runoff of titanium in the sediments off of the continent, and less titanium uh, indicates er, then that there's less runoff. And so we have this pre-classic abandonment in the 2000, in 8200, and then again we have another dip 
in about AD 800 and 900 where the terminal classic collapse began. So it was captured very well with uh, modern paleoclimatology. Population declined precipitously in many areas during the Maya terminal classic. Forest cover declined, droughts occurred, sea level had risen, and soil was eroding both in the late pre late pre-classic and the late classic. Um, this graph summarizes um, in parallel several different um, factors, both um, uh, physical and biological and human. And so we have um, a graph of Maya population density. This is after work by Tim Beach and Nick Dunning and Rice and Rice. So this red graph, there, it, it's just a high to low scale. You have um, population rising and then you see this precipitous drop off. So there was definitely a population crash uh, about 900 AD. You see uh, forest vegetation on the blue line, very high until um, population begins to rise and it drops in mirroring uh, the Maya, Maya uh, population growth. We go to an interesting graph, soil erosion, where soil erosion is quite low on the timeline, but then as population pressures rise, you see soil erosion begin to rise. But what you see also here are a couple of downward spikes in soil erosion. Uh, work done by Tim Beach, Nicholas Dunning, and others have found um, that there were very effective conservation measures that the Maya put into place, terraces and, and soil conservation uh, that helped at least to stem the tide of soil erosion for a while. So the Maya were very aware of environmental change and did something about it. We have um, a rather short amount of time, so I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. Defining collapse. Um, there are a lot of different ways to define collapse, whether you're a, a historian or a biologist or a geographer or a climate scientist. Number, number of systems have different definitions for collapse. Uh, many of you have probably read work by Jared Diamond, uh, his book Collapse. He considers the ancient Mayas a special case of collapse. He defines it as a drastic decline in human population and or social systems extended over time. McNeil, an environmental historian, observes, if a people, language, and a culture survive, is this collapse? McNeil notes Diamond defines collapse differently as either human numbers or cultural complexity decline drastically. Uh, McEnany, also concluded that the Maya kings did not deal effectively with economic and political changes, but the Maya society neither succeeded nor failed. It changed in the face of these challenges. Um, our work, uh, Lazada Beach, Beach, and Dunning, we use a definition of collapse as enduring social, political, and economic decline for multiple human generations. Turner and Sabloff summarized that four decades ago, scholars agreed the late classic Maya collapse was the result of complex systems interactions. Um, w the Diamond and McEnany, both in their books um, Collapse and Questioning Collapse, have um, a similar list of five to six uh, societal collapse factors, but they include environmental variables as well. Then moving on, um, Hodel et al. really moved the science forward in terms of understanding the relationship between the, what is the Great Maya Drought and Collapse. Um, Hodel provided the first unambiguous evidence of climate drying between AD 800 and 1000, marked by the, the, the yellow arrow, arrow where we have the, the, the classic period. Um, I'm working on an evolution of climate change research in the Maya Collapse, and due to time, I will compress this section of the talk. Uh, it will um, be included in what I hope is a paper and, and what I hope is a volume that, that, that comes out of this session or out of, out of this uh, Chapman conference, so I'll move forward. Um, but I'll start just <laughs> with attitudes towards the rise and the fall of the Maya in 1954. Um, in reading the relationship with the environment, there is no mention of climate or soil erosion. Uh, J.E.S. Thompson praises the Maya for developing in thickly forested tropics and outstripping neighbors. So this is sort of a climate, not a cl that climate was not a collapse factor. Moving forward into the 1970s, um, there were two examples. In the 1970s, largely the focus was on the rise of research on wetland agriculture in terms of um, not just slash and burn agriculture, but looking for ways people fed themselves with the rise of population, so look at more extensive agriculture. So there was um, very little discussion of climate change or collapse in that literature. Colbert 
1973, in the Great Maya Collapse book, focuses on complex systems interactions. Okay, we'll move forward. I also did a literature review, and using some of the, um, the analysis that we've all been learning and talking about, looking at whether people make a firm commitment to certainty or uncertainty in the literature. And some are very firm about what they say, others are not so much. I have an example of hedging in 1981. The record allows at some point for the inference of climatic changes having substantial effects, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of long sentences in this literature. Others, though, take a very firm stand. Abrupt collapse, crop failures, little potable water, severe drought. So again, um, I'll, I'll be happy to share this uh, in the interest of time I'm moving forward. What we do come forward to is that there's more and more certainty about the Great Maya drought being an event that affected the Maya and the Maya being uh, important players on changing the, their environment. And by the time we get to this decade, complexity and certainty um, are a, a strong suit in the literature. So uh, we'll spend our remaining time um, visualizing the Maya drought. So again, we, we go to David Hodel's uh, breakthrough paper in Nature in 1995 uh, uh, on looking at lake cores from Lake Chichan Kanab in Yucatan, where again, the Maya terminal classic period, uh, and actually that, that pre-classic abandonment as well, both show up in the, in the uh, geochemical record, uh, including uh, oxygen 18 and sulfur and so forth. So we begin seeing a lot of graphs of this type um, along a geologic timeline, but then um, these gra graphs begin to put also the archaeological timeline along the side to begin relate human change and environmental change. Uh, a wonderful article that came out in Science in 2012 is by Kenneth et al. And um, PowerPoint doesn't do their graphics justice, so I encourage you to go online and take a look at um, their graphics, putting together, again, this human and environmental evidence along a timeline. Here, Kenneth et al. uses evidence from spilothems, lake cores, and comparative synthesis. Their certainty is firm and that it's a complex system. There were two stages of collapse, multiple systems, and a climate influence. So here, this um, kind of the fireworks at the end of their paper uh, puts together all kinds of wonderful information, both um, El Mirador decline, rise of Tikal, um, historic drought examples, um, climatic information, uh, dated monuments, urban centers, and so forth, interpolity war index. So a number of different environmental and cultural factors all together in one um, very readable graphic. Um, Kennett and Beach, which is forthcoming, have taken it a step further to put these graphics in spatial context or geographical context. So I'll just move forward quickly through these as well, uh, noting the uh, kinds of connections between Maya polities, whether they're uh, antagonistic or diplomatic or lineage, family, or subordinate connections in this relationship. We'll move forward um, to the end. Um, in our own research, we found that the Maya wetland agriculture came to a halt in the late classic in northwestern Belize, despite abundant water. So despite the fact that much of the Maya world was experiencing a drought, our Maya wetland agriculture in northwestern Belize came to a halt, despite huge infrastructure devoted to intensive agriculture. So we return to this case of the Maya drought and abandonment in northwestern Belize, visualizing with multi-proxy evidence visualizing such things as pollen diagrams, carbon ratios, <laughs> and try and synthesize this and visual, visualize the abandonment history in this graphic. We're near the end, where our, our time runs along the bottom line, our depth and our excavations into those wetland profiles is on the um, y-axis, and we have paleosols, buried soils underneath wetlands that hadn't formed yet, and then we have um, aggradation and agricultural fields being formed and canals being dug, and then the canals begin to fill up, and that represents abandonment in this scenario. So our conclusions, understanding and communicating the relationship between climate and the Maya collapse recognizes the importance of climate change and drought, and the importance of human factors, resource management, and leadership. These are strong themes throughout. Certainty of climate change and drought increases over time. 
interdisciplinary research increases over time and communication of the complex relationships improved understanding and consensus about the great Maya droughts. The resilience of the Maya and complex systems are also major themes, especially in the classic period. However, despite technological and resource bases, the ability to respond to changing environments, including sea level rise and soil erosion, collapse still was an in inevitable in the late classic, largely driven by leadership failure and underscored by drought, especially in the Maya lowlands interior. Thank you for your time.